My one caveat when I sort of speak today would be that I think I'm going to take the liberty of being a little bit more candid. Um, and I, with full disclosure, uh, obviously, having exited the media and entertainment industry about six or seven years back, I can have the luxury of being a little bit more candid because I'm from the outside, uh, and I don't have to necessarily worry about uh, who I'm necessarily talking about on one side. But I think it also gives me a very different dimension to what uh, we want to do. I do remember when we started off at Figgy Frames here, uh, the film industry, which still represents about, I think, 10% of the media and entertainment pie, represented, of course, 90% of the first four rows that ever were sitting in the, in the sort of, um, uh, and always there was somebody glamorous from Bollywood lighting the dia, and I'm sort of, in some parts nostalgic, in some parts happy to see that we're now getting down to business and we've got everyone in a suit lighting a very swift dia rather than a long drawn out process from whatever it wants to go there. Um, the other part I think I can recall and remember is the fact that over the last 20 years, and I think Fiki started that, was the global reports, and the, we've got almost the big four, some form or the other, contributing um, to, to the reports of where really the media and entertainment industry is. And I think with that, I'd say it's a cup half full and a cup half empty. And I think for all of us here, we need to understand what the opportunity is, but we also need to understand where we've nearly uh, left out. And I think from time in memorial, We'd always get excited about the report, and I think there's one going to be disclosed here of how we're going to be a $100 billion industry, et cetera. And every year, I think, I would say more or less, we were at about 50% of the target that we set out, or the big fours would set out for what the propensity of this thing was. And I kind of, when I was jotting down some notes last night, sort of introspected as to why. I mean, why would it be that Here's an industry that had such incredible scope, and we do have, and it is one of the sort of landmark and sunrise industries here. Did we always feel we were falling short of something that we could always have to break out? And I kind of put down two or three broad thoughts. For me, having lived the world, and especially from the outside as an entrepreneur, I wanted to count as to how many sort of founders, leaders, and entrepreneurs really have there been that have sort of hurtled and led the media and entertainment industry. And there have been some phenomenal ones, and there are right now some phenomenal ones. But I think there were few and far between. And if you see some of the other economies and how we're doing in many of our startups here, it's really been the drive of the entrepreneurs, the founders, and of course, the corporate leaders all put together. And that to me felt that that's an opportunity for many of you all here also who are young and aspiring, to look at how we can strengthen this part. Because this industry can't just work on passion. It needs much more than that. And it needs leadership. It needs founders. It needs an entrepreneurial spirit. The second one, what I introspected, was really how much of real investment has gone into the media and industry. And we can say a lot. And we can also say little. And I think I won't make a tabulation of that. But today, if I were to sort of look at the e-commerce sector, I think today more money is going to the food technology sector and the delivery sector than the media and entertainment sector. Of course, there are rare examples. Um, News Corp and 20th Century Fox have had made deep investments in the country from way back in the 1992s and onwards. And now more recently with Disney with the acquisition of Fox and Star. But otherwise, if you sort of look at how much of real equity is formed and flowed into the media and entertainment sector, you'd actually find that it's not as much as it needed to be. And I think that's also an opportunity for where we're a cup half full and a cup half empty. And lastly, I would say, you know, what is a media company today? And where are we standing out on that? Why is it that a games-originated company like Tencent in China still has three times the market cap, though now it's been reduced in the last six months, so two times the market cap of the number of one uh, global media company, which is the Walt Disney Company. And why, for example, in many extents, 
the Bennett Coleman Group, which has been around for the last 30 years and, and actually touches our lives in so many ways, has taken 130 years, and yet you have Geo that's taken two years and three years to look at a very dynamism. And I think if you sort of introspect on some of these thoughts, these are just some of my opening comments of what I wanted to do. I was asked to talk a little bit and share because of my entrepreneurial journey, and all I can say is, in my 25 years overall in media before I moved out, there were many, many more failures than there were successes. And I think sometimes I always look out with a smile on my face when somebody says, oh, but you exited the business, or you sort of looked at it, where are you going to create value, and you're always out there to exit the business. And I think the only reason I'm standing here today is because I stuck it out. And I think that, in especially in a sector like media and industry, is actually a badge of honor because you really stuck it out, because it needs a sense of resilience. So for many of you here today, some of you all may have joined the sector and industry for the glamour, and I guess realized 15 minutes later, not even one year later, that there isn't that kind of glamour in the sector. Many of you all got in there with the thought that, hey, I have a great idea, but frankly realized, who cares? There are about 10 great ideas being born every second. It's much, much more about execution. And then the third is, how many of you all are here to stick it out? And I think that's just part of my opening comments. I want to just sort of broadly talk about two broad themes today. One, consolidation, which I think in many ways leads to disruption. And the second one is my introspection, again, with a caveat that um, of things that I think I envy in the sector and what I don't envy. Uh, and again, with full disclosure, that I've been guilty to creating some of these models myself and doing many of the things that I can right now talk with gumption from the outside, but I've been very much part of the insider when many of these things happened, the good and the bad. But you know, consolidation, and I think the last two years, you can't introspect more about consolidation than the last 20 years. Uh, firstly, it's a very big word, this word consolidation, but actually it means in some form, you run out of innovation in some form and creative ideas. And I think that's something to sort of introspect on. I personally think it's more of the same thing with much less impact. Companies that look to consolidate and buy, they love what they see in the other party, and that's why they want to buy it. But when they come together, more or less outside of maybe two out of 100 cases, it's really downhill from there. And I think that's something that's, that's a challenge that gets faced. And I think it's an introspection that we really want to do. For many people, consolidation is growing with a balance sheet instead of the profit and loss. And what do I mean for that, if I were to sort of simplify that, is it might take me half a billion dollars to build this business over five years, but I can acquire something for 700 million, it'll sit in my balance sheet, you know, three years later I'll take a non-cash write-off of 50% of that because things didn't work out at that level, but it's a growth engine. But to me, one of the biggest challenges, and I call it the biggest enemy for consolidation, is culture and ego. And I'm saying that because I think for many of us here in this room also, India is going to be at the centerpiece of many of these. And I think the big challenge for, for many is going to be really being able to understand that part. There's a reason, in my personal view, why Netflix has been able to do something over the last few years, because they're primarily a content company. But you had YouTube and Google, who could have done pretty much that over the last decade. My sense is, when you've got depth in technology, you always look at creative as the outsiders, and vice versa in some form. And I think these are elements to sort of really introspect on. But I think it's a fantastic landscape that's happened there. You've got a telecom company like AT&T that has just bought Time Warner. From what I understand, the first thing uh, the telecom heads did was ask most of the creative people to leave uh, and replace them, because obviously they would know better how to work through and consolidate a creative company. And then you've got the most creative media company in the world, the Walt Disney Company, uh, looking to acquire a major part of the most entrepreneurial media company in the world, which is 20th Century Fox. And I think if you see that pan out over the last uh, one year, it's an interesting process to, 
to look at that, because what you've got is an incredible entrepreneur in Rupert Murdoch. And I think for entrepreneurship and in media, one of the biggest things is about timing. If you can get your timing right, you can get a lot of things right in that context. And I think to look at the environment here, and I think many of that is going to have its tectonic shifts even in India, uh, where two extremely in interesting and incredible cultures are going to come together and impact in many, many positive ways for all of us. But there you had a Walt Disney company looking to acquire a major part of Fox, because from where I sit, Walt Disney is an incredible company, but didn't have the international profile that Sky, and a much closer home, an incredible asset in Star brought to the table. And then you had a Comcast, who had a history of five years back looking to acquire Disney, but then was rebuffed by the management, and therefore had some unfinished business, who made a counter and competitive bid to bid for uh, 20th Century Fox. And then you have, of course, uh, the smartest entrepreneur uh, in media in the world sitting by and watching the value go up by $20 billion while two companies decided to up the bid. And then you have one of them saying, well, we're going to have to disrupt this even further. And they go out and acquire uh, Sky, which is pretty much half of what they bought the international global part of the business of 20th Century Fox for. Though I think that was a win-win situation because it's not a phenomenal asset for Disney to own. But for a telecom company, it was an interesting one to get a head start on. So you narrow it down to this incredible asset called Star in India. Uh, full credit to the entire management team here uh, to actually create that kind of value. And I think um, Uday's leadership, you know, for all of us who we all admire here from time to time and as always. Um, and if you look at that element, that's, I think it's not, it's unfinished business because then you have a phenomenal local business by an incredibly visionary entrepreneur called Subhash Chandra who built ZTV. And I think all of us really understand that there's going to be some sense of consolidation in that space. So it'd be quite ironic if Comcast were to look at Z and then you've got these major assets. And to some extent, India is a little bit of the playing field of what that goes. And that's why I thought it was a little bit relevant to give a little bit of this context and history there because now you've got this uh, asset that's being bought for its global expansion and then you've got a contrarian view in some ports and I think uh, it's going to be fun. I can say it's going to be fun from the outside but I think it's just going to be fun from uh, multiple elements of that. But I think those are tectonic shifts that I think will happen. You can't ignore the fact that you have an incredibly ambitious company in Geo that's looking at almost all aspects. It's no longer a telecom company, it never was. I think Mr. Ambani made it quite clear that from the beginning that he was looking at this being a sort of an integrated company. So obviously, Viacom gets consolidated into Geo, and then you've got someone there who's gonna have huge global ambitions. And then of course, you have the Lone Ranger in the South, which has really stuck it out in terms of Sun, Sun and Maran. So if you look at some of these landscapes here, I think in some ways, there's been a phenomenal amount of change, and I think in some ways, we're sitting at a very, very uh, exciting doorstep of where we want to go. I worry about a few things in this context, having said all of that. Firstly, I think India is one of the most least regulated companies when it comes to media. Sure, we have a few anomalies when it comes to why can't somebody own 100% of a cable company or a DTH company, et cetera, but by and large, you don't need to be a resident in this country like you do in the United States to run a broadcast network. You can fly in on your private gen for three days, go back out, and you can still own a network in this country. So it's substantially unregulated. Overall, I think we're about the last really large market. China's pretty much shut out for most of the global people from any point of view when it comes to media and entertainment. And therefore, I think it's got to be a good strike and a good balance of what I think has got to be India ownership versus just being the playing field for global organizations. But again, that's my personal point of view. At the end, I want to just sort of summarize on uh, some headlines. What do I think are things that I don't envy when I'm looking at it from the outside in the sectors here and some of the sectors that I think I do envy? And not in any order, the ones I don't envy right now ironic as it may sound, is really the broadcasting sector. Because 
in a sense, I would wonder where do we go from here? Most of the sectors there, we haven't been able to really, really innovate to that extent. The companies that constitute that now have broken out and many of them have innovated. And I think, again, back to Star being the exemplary model, whether it's been in sports, whether it's been with Hotstar, whether it's been in a very, very diverse view of looking at the entire spectrum. But by and large, if you look at the broadcasting sector, doesn't have my envy, challenging for us to figure out what's the next level of innovation. If you look at the kids segment today, the definition of kids is going through an overall. I mean, there's no concept of a four to 14 age group, which we would discuss when we started out Hungama at that time, a kids channel. The youth space, again, substantially disrupted, and most of them have pretty much gone out of television and broadcasting viewership completely and totally. If you look at news, yes, we're in an election year and there'll always be 10 new new channels that'll come up and then nine will go off. But there's a sense of resilience there. I think it's almost one news channel per news anchor. So, you know, I think if we have seven more new anchors, there'll be seven more news channels. And that might happen just before election day also. So that, that I don't think uh, there's gonna be a, a, a problem on. Uh, if you look at the English space, both in terms of movies and the English, again, very difficult and very challenging in terms of where do we bring in the next level of innovation? Because again, nobody's really looking at appointment viewing and everyone's looking at the on-demand viewing, everyone's looking at binge watching. The consumer trend has changed substantially. And now with the regulations where each and every one as a consumer can choose, it's a challenging time. So good businesses, but not something that one can envy from the outside. Cinema. Uh, I think, again, I've been a proponent of this and I've been part of the sector, and all I can say is we're about as insular as it gets. And I can say that again as being part of the industry, not from talking about the industry. And I don't mean that in a condescending manner or in an extremely critical manner, but it is insular because the kind of scope we have for this sector to actually blow out has been incredible. But I think our ability to innovate, to harness, to take feedback, to understand what the consumer really wants. I mean, I think for the last 10 years, we've been celebrating the 100 crore club. I mean, even inflation has made that 100 crore club into a 10 crore club. So I think those are the sort of uh, sandboxes that we need to necessarily break out of. Another one that I would not envy, of course, is the cinema theater business. Very, very tough, very tough. I think. Uh, it's primarily because it's a high debt business, uh, it's a high rent business, and unfortunately all the companies are public listed. So you can't take a long-term view on anything because you've got to go with the quarter-on-quarter -quarter view. And many parts of their decision-making process today is actually alienating the cinema and the creative passions of that. One of them, which I constantly have an argument with them wherever I can, is the fact that we've been trying to get content down from our two and a half hour storytelling to a tight two hours. And cinemas now fill up the interval with 15 minutes of advertising and pretty much have scared off the younger audience from even wanting to come to see a movie theater. And I think those are some of the ones that I, I would challenge as we go forward on. If I were to introspect on what I do envy, yes, the content sector today I think is out for a good five year honeymoon. The reason I use honeymoon is because I think I've been through three or four of the cliffs and the abysses of the content cycle enough to know when is a honeymoon and then when comes the settling down and the other vocabulary that goes with that. And sure, there have been 100, 150 television producers and we'll go up to 400 and then we'll come back to 150. So really it's a phenomenal opportunity, but unless we can consolidate and get some scale into that business, it's gonna be a challenge. And the one thing I worry about it is it's still work to hire. Our thinking is not one where we're looking at originating ideas, taking the risk, owning the intellectual property, rather than just being a work for hire. So it's an extremely interesting and enviable sector, but not to that extent. Sports, I think, is something that's obviously, and I don't mean necessarily buying of rights, it's really creating the multiplicity of sports that this country needs. We're one of the few, few, few countries in the world where actually sports can be, and it is in many aspects, obviously, a strong form of both media and entertainment, and a big driver for subscription and a big driver 
for the advertising revenues. So I think the investment we need to make into the ecosystem of sports is incredible. It's just about starting up. It'll have its ups and downs, but it's for the long haul. And I think for many of you are looking at career options, this is something that I think is really a sunrise industry. The third one, of course, is platforms, but really the ones that can afford and be able to get large pay platforms. The fourth for me is really uh, anything or anything that we're doing in the, in the creative form for the 14 to the 24 age group, but in B2C businesses and not to B businesses, because that I think is really where the future is. They've moved away. We can get their attention span, and that primarily means everything that's interactive, everything that's games, and many of the other aspects that are not yet so clearly defined when we look at the media and entertainment business. And the fifth, but definitely not the last, is edutainment. And in my second uh, innings, that's the one part that I'm focusing on, which is education, specifically in the terms of learning. And I think at the end of the day, all I can say, having done on both parts and having been substantially involved in the education business in the last five years, at the end of the day, learning is storytelling. And if you can tell stories in an enthralling manner, really, when are you going to learn when you've got a phenomenal professor giving you a lecture? If you ask a Harvard student what does he most recall about his two years when he did his MBA, he'll talk about the great case studies. So in many ways, education and learning, which at the moment is looked as an outside sector, is actually so much part of a media sector. And when you bring all of that together in a confluence, I think it makes a great one. And so really as a closing comment, I think the companies of tomorrow, even in the media sector, really need to be consumer companies and not media companies. And I'm hoping not in the next 20 years, which is the 40th year of FICA, but in the next five to eight years, we won't be just calling this media and entertainment, but really my definition is the future of consumer companies of tomorrow. And the reason I say that is because we all need to introspect that while we've been building many things that we build here, how much of our real attention goes to the core consumer versus the core advertiser or the core stakeholder, whether it's the shareholder or you're invested in a company. And I think not as much as this sector needs it to be. So if you look at the consumer company of tomorrow, and I think there are some that are mo moving in that direction, there's obviously television, which is going to be a mainstay. It's a 50-50 between what I would call a B2B and a B2C business. Films, but pretty much the way I think Walt Disney does it, because they've got the most incredible movie model now in the world. It's only about less for more, and it's only about building global franchises that touch it in multiple ways. And I think if you can look at that, that's incredible. It's a pure B2C business. The third one is platforms. The fourth one is games, which I think is, everyone talks about it in the periphery part of it, but it's a core, and I think India's got an incredible opportunity to be able to leapfrog as far as that is concerned. Fifth is sports, and sixth is um, the ed tech sector. So I'd like to end by just leaving one thought here, that I think if we have concluded 20 years of Fiki Frames, and if we had to do a report card over the next five to seven years, I would say that if we can set our minds on being less and less a company of arbitrage, a company of being just a service model, a company of being just, or an organization or a country of being just work for hire, but looking more in terms of innovation, origination, and ownership, that's where we need to be. Thank you.